Uh, we're going to talk now about smart grids and the uh, the Internet of Things. And this seems like a really interesting subject because if I, uh, if I cast my mind back to 20, 25 years ago when I got into this sector, everybody was asking what smart grid was. And I guess the Internet of Things is the, is, is the thing that's enabled smart grid to define itself. So we have two really interesting uh, speakers today. Paul Beck from uh, Lucy Electric. He's the innovation director of Lucy Electric and uh, is a qualified electrical engineer, having spent quite a few years in the um, aerospace sector. He uh, set up a company, a smart grid business called GridKey, uh, which was sub subsequently bought by Lucy Electric uh, and is now the innovation director and has been since 2020. And Lucy Electric are sort of key players in the switchgear side, very much on the low voltage distribution side of the um, of the equation. The other speaker is Mark Potter, who's the CTO of 3TI Energy Hubs. Uh, again, uh, qualified in uh, electronic and engineering and computing, and also having spent some time in the aerospace sector. But for the uh, for 14 years, he was the um, or he was involved in Protein Electric, uh, focusing on applications engineering uh, before becoming chief engineer. And since uh, 2021. He's been involved in the CTO of 3TI Smart uh, 3TI Energy Hubs, who uh, develop um, EV charging hubs. So integrated EV charging hubs that include PV, uh, EV charging infrastructure, um, and obviously grid load management and that kind of thing. So I'm going to ask, um, sorry, uh, Paul, Paul, and uh, um, Mark to join me. Can you can you share? Can you open your Put, can you put your uh, cameras on? I, one of my yeah, I can't put my cameras. It's, it needs to be put on by the the host, I think. But hopefully, you can hear me. Yeah, I'm expecting you to be able to. <laughs> be good if I could see. Is, is Mark there as well? Uh, I've, I've turned my I've turned my camera on, but um, perhaps that's not working. Thanks. No, your cameras just come on. Okay, so we've got everybody now. Excellent. Thank you for that. So I'm going to start off by. Um, Perhaps asking uh, Mark to start off by telling us a little bit about 3TI Smart Hubs. Um, I think the, the interest, so perhaps just a bit of context, the interesting thing about this discussion, I think, is we've got somebody talking very much about the, the consumer side, the load side, but then also Paul focusing on the on the low voltage network side. And, and interesting to see how, they, how that, 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 that equation balances and also how IoT enables us to bridge the gap and use information to increasingly uh, make those two uh, parts of the equation uh, increasingly intelligent and responsive, I guess. So, Mark, if you, if, you, if you want to kick off and tell us a little bit about 3TI. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And good morning, everybody. Um, quite nice to see a couple of, of names I recognise on the attendees list. So, uh, good morning to those I already know. Um, yeah, so, so 3TI really operates behind the meter, um, which is where I'll dif differentiate from uh, the work that Paul does. So we are um, very much on the on the consumer, or I guess you call them prosumers now side. And there's two kind of key branches to the business that we have. One is um, what we call the big solar car parks, which are megawatt scale, kind of utility scale projects, which are feeding in behind the meter. We've got um, ones at data centers like JP Morgan. We've got Bentley Motors up in Crewe, a big factory. And uh, that that is kind of predominantly about solar generation, reducing the use of grid energy, and um, we put kind of EV charging underneath there as uh, and, and storage um, where it's necessary as a way of um, combining the three technologies of 3CI. And those three technologies are solar generation, energy storage, and um, EV charging. And then the other sort of products that we, we use for the smaller um, market space where essentially it's not commercially viable to put in these big massive solar car parks is the product you see behind me the papilio 3 and that's uh predominantly a, a charging hub it creates 12 charging spaces out of 14 parking spaces it has uh solar generation as you can see on top of it it has energy storage in one end electrical distribution in the other end and and those 12 ev chargers and then um that is a kind of a, a I, I call it smart grid in a box because when we put that on site, its functionality within the box operates as a smart grid, um, essentially within the boundary of the unit. But actually, it turns our site into a smart grid as well um, with some of the proprietary control systems that we put onto it. 
Okay. Well, th th thanks for that. Perhaps we can talk a, a little bit more in a moment about. I, I, I guess your charging hubs are very um, affected by the changing use of EV and the different drivers required, you know, for, from EV drivers and from fleets in terms of, you know, reducing costs and decarbonisation. So perhaps we can we can pick up that on that in a moment. But uh, Paul, can you give us a bit of an introduction to uh, to your business and uh, your, your relationship with Smart Gribs and IoT? Certainly, yes, yeah. so, and I think picking up a little bit on on some of the things that John was saying in the in the opening comments, the, the clearly the use profile, the load profile is changing dramatically as as low carbon technologies are are, are being incorporated into the grid. The, the 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 challenge for the low voltage part of the network is at the moment it's just not measured. Um, so historically, there has been enough. Um, knowledge of the, the likely loads and the timings of those and so on. Um, the, the, the grid was, the low voltage part of the grid was designed at a time in, in, under CGB that, and where they, that, you know, large transformers, larger cables than, than, um, were, were put in. But we're getting to a point now where because of this increased load, um, and, and the, the, the change of use pattern, um, understanding what's happening on that low voltage part of the network is 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 absolutely essential. We're already seeing transformers that are getting uh, incredibly hot um, at certain points of the day. Um, you know, to put it into context, the, the, there's around half a million substations um, at the low voltage part of the network, and probably from that is is going to be about one and a half million cables that come off of that that go to people's homes. Um, so the, the the scale is 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 much larger. The scale of understanding that low voltage network is 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 much more uh, complex than it is at the medium voltage and high voltage, which which by and large are, are reasonably well measured. And picking up again on something that John said, you know, the, the the what's important to the consumer is availability of electricity. We expect to turn the lights on, and we expect the lights to come on. Um, so when, when we turn the switch on. Um, at the moment, if a fuse blows in a substation, we rely on consumers phoning to say, I'm out of power. Uh, that does not to us seem a particularly um, 21st century way of doing things. Um, it's, it's, it's really um, you're looking at, um, at, at how we can understand better. And I think there's some really interesting things that we've started to see. So again, Jane, John made a comment about um, human choices versus machine choices for, for when his EV charges. So we're already seeing on certain um, cables where at midnight, where the, the, the cost of electricity goes down and therefore the chargers switch on, that actually we see this peak in the morning for breakfast and we see this bigger peak in the evening for dinner. And then we see a much larger, an enormous peak at midnight as all the EV chargers turn on. So without understanding that, it's impossible to control it. So so what what we do through grid key, through Lucy Electric, is, is, is provide that monitoring. And what we're now doing is taking that monitoring, taking that data, turning it into information, and then how can we better manage the grid. So that's really in a nutshell what we're doing and why there's such a big problem is that nobody knows what's going on on the LV part of the grid at the moment. So, so what, 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 what proportion of the network is monitored? How, how many substations have you got out there bit, oh, bit being monitored at the moment? Well, at the moment, the, 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 um, as part of ED2, um, I think by the end of ED2, it will be something like 20% um, of the total substations will be monitored. So another three years time. Um, so it's, it, but it's an enormous job. You have that number of monitoring systems um, and not least that amount of data that's now coming back. Um, you know, if you're only monitoring you know, a few thousand um, substations you know, with, at the medium voltage level, then all of a sudden you've got this, this influx of data. And then so managing the data becomes as much of a problem as actually getting the data into the, or getting the, the, the monitoring equipment onto the network. Um, so it's it's a major shift. Um, uh, and is 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 that a big enough sample for? I mean, maybe this is a question for the DNOs, but is is that a big enough sample to be able to get a fairly good reflection of the of the wider network? I I it, it's better than nothing, um, of course, but I don't think it's going to be enough because of the variability. Um, so there's a, 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 I talked about this midnight peak. There, the, the alternative part to that is that um, 
there's a story of a, a, a pub in Scotland where there was a, a small village. All of the users, all of the guys drinking in the pub had electric vehicles. And one of them said, sorry, I'm a bit late, um, but there's a big storm coming through and I wanted to put my vehicle on charge. And the other guy said, well, that's yeah, that's a very good idea. They left their pints. They all went and switched on their vehicle charging. So all of a sudden, you've got this this change of behaviour that no one would have predicted. It's not it's not something that we would we would have seen historically. Um, exactly the same thing happened with Tesla in, in in California. That they put out a note to all the Tesla drivers, and all the drivers tried to charge at the same time. So you can get these these very strange effects that you haven't seen before. And at that point, the LV part of the network and, and quite possibly you know, the medium voltage and high voltage just can't cope with that level of change. So it's it's not, you know, monitoring is only the first part. It's where you go from the monitoring into the control to how do you put how do you put automated processes in place, automated systems in place that stop you burning out a transformer. If those guys had switched on their EV chargers and the transformer had gone bang or the, the fuse had popped, that wouldn't have helped them at all. Well, thanks for that. So that, that feels like a really good segue over to Mark then to talk about uh, how how consumer behaviour is changing and, and how you're responding to that with uh, you know, a handful of technologies integrated there on your hubs. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it's a good opportunity to pick up on what, what Paul was just describing. You know, monitoring is one thing. Knowing what's happening is one thing, but being able to do something about it is what is, is, uh, is key. And that's actually where... Um, you know, I remember once uh, somebody saying to me, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And that's very much the approach that we've been taking towards um, our, our infrastructure solutions. So for me, there's two kind of key connectivity um, challenges and, and importances. Mm-hmm. As you hear from Paul, you know, without, you know, throwing buzzwords out there, big data and connectivity is actually crucial in, in the grid of the future. From the consumer side, Obviously, consumers just want hassle-free charging on a t- rock-up plug-in, and it just to work. My my background in automotive and aerospace means you try and eliminate as many single-point failures as you can in that system. Uh, so, first and foremost, we try and provide that customer that uh, that uh, that delivery experience um, to the EV drivers. But secondarily to that, you know, a key part of the of the smart grid concept and having these distributed energy resources, the technical term having EVs that you can turn turn down the load that they're taking, having energy storage that you can either uh, use to pump energy into the grid or, or, or take energy out of the grid, and even having connected electric vehicles with energy storage that can be used bidirectionally, where you can actually take energy out of those vehicles and pump those into the grid. This kind of transition to prosumer is happening you know, really quite quickly. And so we're quite excited. We're involved in an Innovate project um, to take kind of V2X onto the next level at the moment. So I'll have a V2X version of this video coming out very soon. Um, and, and it's exactly that. When you're able to monitor and understand what is happening at, in our case, the site level behind the customer's meter, but now integrate it with the smart grid technologies, which are responding to the data that Paul is gathering, uh, that Paul's team are gathering, as the asset that you can use to alleviate that local network congestion to to deal with those load issues, to smooth out um, those peaks and those troughs um, and to make use of the assets that are there. That's really where there's a, a lot of um, value to the grid. I think the, the last estimates from the National Grid are something like 58 billion pounds of infrastructure upgrades between now and 2035. That's a colossal amount of money. Um, and, and uh, you know, frankly, one of the logistical challenges, have you got enough trained people and, and can you get projects moving fast enough to do that? Well, actually, if you can avoid it, if you can use data with control to avoid those infrastructure upgrades, then you've found a way of, of uh, you know, essentially mitigating some of these behavioural challenges um, and these surprises, which would otherwise, you know, create a resilience problem within the grid. And how so? So obviously, your 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 technical solution is driven by consumer behaviour or the, the the behaviour of EV drivers. I mean, do do you think we know how EV drivers are going to behave yet? Because um, presumably, as the as the cost of charging is increasing, the range of vehicles are increasing. How do you how do you um, future proof? I'd say there's a little bit of. Um, 
system. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a little bit of chicken and egg. Okay, so if 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 you invest very heavily in rapid charging infrastructure, I think you're going to push consumers into rapid charging. Um, now that's not necessarily a good thing for the grid when it happens on the way to work or from work and in the mornings and evenings when the grid's already congested. So you end up with a very expensive charging infrastructure solution. Now, if you invest in in the marketplace where we we focus with the kind of workplace destination uh, and and fleet markets then you can create a um, an opportunity for charging that isn't at home during peak times or uh, overnight for those you know people who don't have the ability to charge at home and it isn't rapid charging where you need you know you, you've got a bank of 10 250 kilowatt uh, rapid chargers which suddenly you'll get used at once at six o'clock in the evening so you have to um in, invest in the right technologies and the right solutions and those also create the opportunities right so a rapid charger is not an opportunity for grid flexibility because the users uh you know call it the, the volt and bolt model they want to get in get charged and get out as quick as they can which means they want that 250 kilowatt as fast as they can off of the grid at the same time everybody else wants it at the same time as everybody showers and heating is on you create the opportunity to charge at work or charge at the gym or charge at another location and the dwell time is going to be longer you've now got an asset that could afford to slow down for 20 minutes maybe an hour or even two hours during the, the day so you know for example our v2x unit is 30 kilowatt dc now why do we do 30 kilowatts well because most cars will only charge at 11 kilowatts at 30 kilowatts charging you can discharge at maybe 15 kilowatts for a couple of hours, then recharge at 30 kilowatts for an hour, having offset that energy use to a time of day where it's cleaner, there's lots more solar on the grid, uh, and, and the grid is less congested. And while the grid is congested, you've been able to take energy out of the battery, put it onto the grid, and that ultimately results in, um, in much better value charging for consumers. So... I think um, if you've seen Octopus recently, they've announced essentially free charging for V2G users because by them being able to flex the asset, charge it when it's convenient, and discharge it when when it's uh, you know when the grid needs it, then it actually creates um, enough value to Octopus that they can give you free EV charging. I think that's you know that is going to massively those kind of uh, structures, those kind of capabilities, are massively going to influence. I think the way people. When and when and where they charge their cars. So you've got a huge amount of value there in flexibility. So Paul, if I if I if I take that back to you, then so we've got Mark creating a lot of flexibility at his end, uh, doing his best to manage the uh, the impact of EV drivers using grid load management, EV, uh, energy storage, etc. You're picking up all the data, passing that onto the DNOs. I mean, is 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 there anything that you can then do a, a at your side to further increase the flexibility? How how's that information used by the DNO and then um, used to solve the problem, I guess? I think this this comes back to, to something that John said, the, the, the complete system thinking. And I think that's the big change. It's not, it's not a technical problem we're, uh, largely that we're trying to solve. I think it's a um, it's as much a commercial problem of, of how do we get the, 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 the transmission operator working with the, the distribution operator working with uh, companies such as Marks with, who have the, the sort of the actuator bit, the, the bit that can change things. So knowing you know, there's no point Mark offering um, very high speed charging if the grid behind it can't support that. Um, so, but likewise, in, in a lot of circumstances, you look at the usage on the grid, and actually, there's quite a lot of spare capacity in the middle of the night or, or even during the day, um, depending on the type of circuit. So, again, it's understanding um, where that spare capacity, when is there spare capacity, and then um, how do we then pass that information? We've already done trials on that, where we've we've used a signal that we've generated from the that we were measuring both the the, the transformer load at, at low voltage, but also the load on the cables, because the cables are probably a more valuable asset than the transformer itself. Um, to replace a transformer is probably around about 15,000 pounds. To replace a kilometer of underground cable is about 100,000 pounds. So protecting that cable as well as protecting the, the transformers is vital. But we created a, a, a control signal um, based upon the amount and that that was very simple for the trial that we did was um, either don't charge, slow charge, 
um, rapid charge or discharge. Um, so we had a, a Nissan Leaf as a, 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 a VTG vehicle, and we were able to discharge during the evening and do exactly what Mark talked about, that we then had enough time to be able to put it onto trickle charge, then onto to full spec, um, charge, and by the morning that vehicle was fully charged and we'd helped out the grid. So I think it's this system thinking that's absolutely vital um, and that, that you know, some of the commercial um barriers that are, are there because each, each organization is trying to make it make money of course that's that's what that's what companies do but it's how we go above that and to to how do we we maximize the assets otherwise we're going to end up with that huge bill that mark talked about in terms of reinforcement for the grid and that then means more more power stations and all the things that have you know why we we're doing low carbon technology in the first place so I think it's this system thinking that's absolutely essential to to, to how we move forward. Um, and I would add, it's not a UK problem; it's a, it's a global problem. You know, that every country I go to um, are having similar problems and similar debates. Um, but it's how you get that um, that that system thinking is, is is absolutely essential, and how you get these groups working together. So if I just if I before we go to questions, if I just capitalise on a bit of serendipity that happened uh, pre pre preceding this call, <laughs> if our if our viewers can picture an extremely soggy Paul Beck yes. having just charged out of a rainstorm in Dubai, uh, explained how dreadfully wet it was, and then shouting something to the the mounts to holy moly, that's the biggest piece of lightning I've ever seen, and then it disappearing. Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think we have to then uh, talk a little bit about resilience. And yeah, I yes. think, you know, from, a, from, a, from, 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 from your side, Paul, obviously, I think you were pretty impressed with the resilience in, uh, in Dubai. I was, um, yes. Yeah, yeah, it would be useful to think about it at that end, but also I think, you know, Mark, from your side, also thinking about it as a consumer side and, you know, what, what are we doing to try and underpin the resilience of these systems? Yes, it was. It was. A, a, I'm sure everybody's read in, in uh, seen on the, the news and so on. It, there, there was some fairly um, fairly impressive rainfall last Tuesday in Dubai. I was I was out there for a trade show that, that ultimately got cancelled. Um, the th the amount of water that fell, they're, they're claiming it was 18 months in, in 24 hours, and I can well believe that. Um, but also there was a, a, um, a lot of big lightning, um, thunder and lightning events. Um, we had about an hour in the evening where I'd say every three or four seconds we were getting a lightning strike. Um, the thing that was really impressive, I was on a, a, a fairly high level in a building so I could see out over some of the city, um, was actually how much the light stayed on. I was really impressed. You, you saw bits of the city would disappear into darkness, but, but given the, the the level of flooding, um, was amazing that the, um, the, the, the power came back on. Hit harder actually was the, the, the telecoms infrastructure. So you, we talk about these smart systems um, so whilst the electricity stayed on and my monitoring systems stayed on um, that we've got installed in Dubai, actually, we couldn't get the data back for a while because the telecoms went down rather than. So back to that total systems thinking, um, it's not just the electricity, it's it's all the supporting um, capabilities around that. And telecoms is an absolutely critical part to it. Um, but it was, yes, it was quite an event last week. And uh, um, we did we did lose Internet for quite a while. I think the biggest challenge actually was not was was the buildings themselves. So the airport. Um, if, again, if you you may have seen some some imagery that came through, um, the buildings leaked like a sieve, and so the the the, the problem with the electricity electrical supply was quite often local. That that, that buildings were it's ultimately why the the exhibition was cancelled because water was running into the electrics within the building, um, not the main supply that was coming to it. So I think I think you know, all credit to um, Dubai Electricity, they're, they're the Electricity and Water Authority, DWA. So I, I guess that was fairly appropriate. Um, but but credit to them for the the resilience that they showed. Um, but it did highlight, you know, the, the, some of the other dependencies we had, particularly the telecoms. But yeah, Thank very you for that. you make it back safely. Hey, Mark, 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 do you want to sort of talk about the um, the provision you're putting into your systems? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is this kind of brings it back to the the kind of the, the if like subject matter, the Internet of Things. You know, the the, the um, you know what you have is a lot of distributed systems now, uh, which have a lot of interdependencies. Now, a lot of EV charging infrastructure is done in a very dependent way. So, you know, frankly, you know, a lot of charge points put out there with a SIM card on every charge point. 
And that means every charge point, even on a site, you might have 20 charge points and those 20 charge points are communicating on their own SIM cards to using the cellular network. Now that makes a really big single point of failure. Uh, if you took at it from a purely business perspective and say, you know, the chances of getting a ZapMap bad review from a bad charge is is twenty times more likely if you've got one, you know, one SIM card in each machine. Um, but actually, from a you know, from a more serious standpoint, if you are using this as grid flexibility and and uh, as a as a service that is not only reliable for EV chargers to be able to get in and and get their vehicle charged, but for grid to be able to flex that system and for it to be able to respond fast enough and respond appropriately, then you need a resilient system. So part of our solution is um, to put in multiple channels to the internet, the what, what you call an aerospace non, or automotive non, non-homogeneous, so different types of communications. Typically, we use a hardwire, ethernet, maybe a fiber line and um, a SIM card as a backup comms as a simple solution to that telecoms outage uh, problem. And we try and reflect that across even within the unit. So, uh, you you know, each charge point has got an Ethernet wire to it, but it will also join a local Wi-Fi hotspot if Ethernet falls off. Uh, And that's part of how we achieve like a high resilience um, in in situ. But there's the the IoT is a really helpful um, development for this because the, the kind of model that sits behind IoT is... You have these um, distributed processing devices. You know, frankly, chip, you know, chips are cheap these days, so you can have quite a low power distributed um, processing device that is able to capture and perform some local functionality and buffer that data using IoT protocols like MQTT. If you've come across that, which is then able to queue up transactions and queue up issues. So, taking a simple, simple example, if you authenticate at a charge point using an RFID card. There's about five or six different internet side servers involved in that process, which means if your internet connection is down, even for a few moments, your user doesn't get the charge. You need to swipe again. And if it's down for a few minutes, well, that user is going to get annoyed and they'll go and try a different charge point and maybe they'll even go to to a different site and you get a bad zap map review and that's the end of it. Whereas if, if you have a local, what you call the edge device, able to take some action in that scenario where that remote system is offline or inaccessible for whatever reason, you can actually just queue up that transaction, make the decision to start charging locally without it needing that internet communication. And then when the internet communication is restored, you can then use that queue, the MQTT uh, buffer, to go and um, process that transaction later. That's a really key way of achieving uptime requirements that are stipulated by the regulatory framework. It's a really good way of ensuring that EV user experience is, is great. It doesn't quite solve the problem of making sure that flexibility uh, is available um, all the time, which is why we have this kind of multi-channel, non-homogeneous um, connection methodology, um, which is a lot of words to say, <laughs> always have a backup plan. <laughs> Trust nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for that. I think we've got about 10 minutes left for uh, questions. I don't know whether, am I, uh, should, should I hand this over to you, Jordan, for taking questions? Do we have any questions from the audience? We don't currently have any questions from the audience. Um, so if there's anything else that you want to discuss or I can come up with some questions, it's uh, <laughs> entirely up to uh, to you guys. Well, a, a, a question, I guess, I, I have for, for for Mark. I mean, a lot of work we're doing at the moment is focusing on um, bus and truck infrastructure. So I think the a truck in particular, where people are well, and, and bus as well, but when people are particularly wanting to sort of uh, ensure charging infrastructure is is available in advance, um, and 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 you know, if you're uh, putting um, electric logistics vehicles where um, every mile is critical and every hour is critical. I'm just wondering whether you're you're starting to link up your hubs or whether infrastructure started to be linked up so that the, the driver can control when the when the um, infrastructure is available and whether this yeah, obviously adds a, a component of data coming into your systems and yeah how you actually how you actually integrate all of this lot and and prioritize the various different signals you're getting in there? Yeah, and, and uh, it's got you know it's quite an interesting observation, isn't it? So I'll, I'll tell you a story, which is that one of the things I wanted to make sure of um, before it became a, a legal mandate is we had a twenty four seven support line that was available. So if there were any issues, they get resolved really quite quickly. Um, so we put quite a lot of effort into setting up uh, that system and making sure that that uh, that was available. 
and we've made sure it's available on all our sites uh, and no bugger uses it. <laughs> and nobody uses it um, because that it, because it's reliable. So for me, you know, rather than focusing on something like ZapMap where you're showing whether the system is reliable, is available or not, it's actually better just to make it available and make sure it is reliable and make sure that mm. if the cell towers get reconfigured, if you know, somebody forgets to pay the bill or whatever the situation is that results in that comms outage, make sure you've got a backup plan. So a high availability is achieved. I think it's much better to focus on provision of service rather than reporting of that service. Mm. The, the other direction that people are heading in at the moment is this kind of reservations mechanism, which is a little bit more complicated because that means that for a you know for a period of time that charge point isn't available to somebody else to use now if you're reserving that 10 minutes ahead perhaps that's not so bad but now implicitly you're now on the motorway you know trying to find an available charge point on your mobile phone tapping away to try and reserve a thing that you're going to get to in the next 10 or 15 minutes if you're reserving it two three four hours ahead well how do you make sure it's available at the right time you know, it, there, there's a lot of people in focusing. Well, I guess this is the yeah, challenge for logistics. Right yeah, I think you know. I, 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 I guess when you look at logistics, when you've got um, either either the hubs at the at the um, at the fleet depots or on on route, yeah. then there's some some systemic approach to linking all this lot up, and um, and you know, feels to me like that's a bit that's a real challenge because you're going to have to say no to some people and and. Almost need a an infrastructure fully committed to one particular fleet. I mean, you know, I think I think ubiquitous infrastructure is the key. Okay, having it available and having the right type of charging available at the right place is the key. All right. So, so for me, like, if you take an example of Papilia, this is this is um, you know, uh, I've said it's it's twelve finish two kilowatt AC charge points. Now that's for the kind of workplace market. Now, if, if that workplace happens to have um, a delivery fleet that is expected to get there around about lunchtime, need to charge up, uh, you know, while they're grabbing lunch and then shoot off in the afternoon. Well, having a handful of uh, DC fast chargers on there, DC rapid chargers on there, which are able to provide that fast enough charge, perhaps by slowing down, um, you know, employee workplace charging that's happening behind it. That's the kind of integrated solution that that, uh, that we would put in place for those kind of scenarios. So I think having... Uh, those systems, it, you know, back to what Paul was saying, is this systems level thinking, okay? What does that energy system look like? What does that utilisation look like? You could do things like, uh, which I know people are working on, like geofencing where you, or, or uh, geo-triggering reservations and these kind of things. But I think the answer is just have more infrastructure, okay? If you do it the right way, if you, if you use some, some of the clever stuff that we put in, you don't need to put these huge demands on the grid, requesting you know masses of upgrade of of uh infrastructure for the one or, or two hours a year where that peak occurs by doing things in this smart grid way by using energy storage and flexible assets and reducing that massive infrastructure cost investment going behind the meter you know it, for us is crucial to enabling that level of um of if you like site customization that's so we, we kind of turn that site into a smart grid you don't need to reserve capacity for heating and air conditioning at the same time because they're probably not going to be on at the same time. But that's kind of the way the infrastructure is designed yeah. typically. So that smart system level thinking, using closed loop systems, feedback, data, being able to process that data and be able to do it in a resilient and reliable manner is the way that you enable this ubiquitous infrastructure at much better value than it's going to cost with a completely open loop system. Yeah. You're designing for the worst case of the worst case on the worst day of the year and the worst year of the decade, you know. Okay. Um, I mean, Paul, if we take that back to the sort of low voltage network level, mm. I mean, is is what what do you what what I mean? I, I know there's sort of things like active uh, grid load management and 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 various other things, but how how do you see the, the IoT helping another level of sophistication at that level? I think the, the, the to be able to make decisions, you need to understand what's going on. And to understand what's going on, that, that information can come from multiple sources. At the moment, we are just measuring the load and voltage on a 
on, on a substation. I think the, the key is going to be combining that with, with data from the, the EV charging companies, with, with data from weather forecasts, with, um, w- w- with other sources of information to create that overall picture. And only then can you really make um, effective decisions. So I think that's the real challenge, that, and it comes back to that system level thinking. Um, you know, when you, when a, an EV is plugged into the grid, uh, into the into a charger at the moment, the vehicle knows how much charge it needs. But I can't find out how much charge it needs. I can't schedule how long that vehicle needs to charge for. Now that information is held, but it's held by the by the vehicle manufacturers at the moment. Um, now I know there's some work going on to integrate that with some of the chargers. Um, but again, so it's, it's it's back to that. How do you share the information? How do you, at a system level, so that you're le- you're actually able to make these these um, um, the, the, you know, these proper decisions? Um, you know, how do you how do you bring all of that data together? And then what's the algorithm that says this is what you should do? I think okay. it's, a lot of it's having a wider data pool and giving people yeah. the opportunity to source the data that they think would be useful. Completely, and that will go across companies and across. So that will go from you know, the TNOs and the DNOs, and um, you know, and and you know, you know, companies like Marks that have got all got data, and it's how do we bring that together, work out what's what's relevant from that data, and then what is you know, how do we control from that? Um, but without that complete picture, you can be causing a problem, you know, solving a problem in one part that creates a problem somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, uh, probably okay. a very pertinent moment to look at the Q and A because um, I was going to say we about cyber. We have one question. The cyber security question has cropped up at the final, the final few minutes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and and you know, you know what Paul's just this highlighted is is a is a key implication, right? The, mm. the best thing we can do is make lots of data available to lots of people. Uh, what that does is create a much bigger cyber, you know, cyber footprint, um, cyber security footprint. That, that is concerning. And certainly when you look at the power of these systems and when you start aggregating 200,000 or 2 million charge points on a single platform, um, a compromise in a platform like that could have very, very serious consequences. You know, it's by the time you've aggregated 2 million vehicles into one platform and you've got control over 2 million vehicles turning on and off, you've got control over a massive energy resource. So absolutely, so cybersecurity is important. There's, I actually don't know if it's happened yet, but there are certainly um, a lot of people looking at adding uh, those large EV charging networks into the uh, nationally significant infrastructure, which is kind of sits alongside, you know, fuel stations and other potential terrorist targets. That brings with it uh, higher security needs. Um, needless to say, as a, as a business and, and my background, and, and talking about the reliability and resilience I was, I was describing earlier, it's not just about having a backup plan of, of how you communicate. It's about making sure it's done securely mm-hmm. at all times, because even just from a business perspective, an outage is a problem. Um, and you know, creating a something with a high uh, sort of potential disruption um, causes is is a big issue. So those single point failures are crucial to avoid or maybe uh, not single point failures but single point vulnerabilities is the way of looking at yeah. it yeah. Uh, and it yeah. and definitely will become okay. an increasing so we have i think we have a minute left so paul any 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 additional comments on cyber security before we call it a day well, of course i'm 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 proposing something that makes it even worse that if we link together all of these systems so that they can share data um that gives you know, many more vectors for attack and so on um i i i think um, one of the things that I learned in, in my, my background in, in aerospace and defense was l- when we were looking at cyber was was being very careful about, OK, so what's the impact if that happens? So if one you know, one person can't charge their vehicle, that's very different to you know, mm, two, two million people not being able to charge their vehicle or to shutting down the grid in London because somebody's got into the SCADA system in the, in the network company. So I think that there is a need to, again, consider it as a systems engineering um, process to understand where data is going and what's the impact if that data is compromised in some way, whether it's it's a denial of attack, denial of service attack, or whether it's it's, it's interfering with the data that's that's being transmitted. Um, so I think it's, it, you know, it, it's an enormous um problem that is is looming as we get to smart grids okay well thank you for that 
thanks thanks both for uh, some very interesting uh, sharing of thoughts there.